Greetings out there in YouTube land. This is Morris Man, and as always, I thank you guys for coming to my channel. Today I'm going to do what's called a musical slideshow. Uh, over the years, I've tried to document through videotape and cameras my musical career. You know, the guitars that I've played and on, the bands that I played in, the concerts. And uh, I'm going to share some, you know, photographs that I've taken over the years. So. I hope you find this entertaining. So the first one is, it's entitled Aria Pro. And this guitar was one of my favorite guitars. I played it extensively in concerts and in studio gigs. And uh, you know, it looks real cool, it has that rock neo guitar color looking thing to it. And uh, this was re one really versatile guitar. Uh, I could easily do the funk thing. It felt good to play as far as the fretboard and the action. They like to turn around easily do the rock thing. And I've entrusted it with, you know, somebody that I care dearly about. I gave it to her, my daughter. You know, so uh, hopefully, you know, she keep it and, you know, cherish it when I'm not here. She can look at it and say, you know, my dad gave me that. And it's a great guitar and I miss it. You know, so that's, you know, that guitar. The next one is uh, one of my first black Fender American Mate Stratocasters. And what I come to realize now versus then is, you know, before I had a near-death experience, I kind of just went with the flow with everybody else as far as what I expect to be or, or everybody is, you know, grieved that this is cool and this works and everything. After I had my near-death experience, uh, I guess the term I can use, which is a Scientology term, which I'm not a Scientologist or into that, but it's called clear, when it's like you can see everything for what it is. And after I had that experience, I kind of just went into that mode where you know, I picked up this guitar and I said, it sounds great, but it feels terrible to play. You know, and it's just not the first time I've played Fender Stratocasters. And I felt that way. I thought it was just me and my hands. But I come to find out years later, just the way that they're designed, the neck, the bridge, and how it's set up, it's real extremely rigid and don't give a lot of, it's too much tension on those guitars. So, you know, I, I, after playing this guitar for like a couple of months, I'm like, oh, this is killing my hands, so I just basically ended up just giving it, well actually I sold it. So uh, you know, no more Fender Strats for me, you know, uh, the J Terses and the Custom Made Guitars by Dave is what I'm going to go with for, you know, you know, for, for the, for forever. Okay, the next one is uh, kind of back down memory lane. Uh, I used to perform at this uh, nightclub called the Copper Box in the 80s and 90s, it used to be on 117th and Halsted. One of the coolest clubs I've ever played in, they had these great promotions every day. And this one here was Panama night on Saturdays. People would get up and perform. And uh, I think uh, the grand, uh, if you won, you won $100 that night. And then you can compete in the grand uh, contest, which, you know, I think they gave like maybe it was like $4,000. You know, so that was some, some good times. I mean, that was a really nice club. And they did a great job with promotions there. Okay, the next one is, I call it Crappy PVM. Like I told you before, uh, me and my bass player, we bought these PVMs while we were on tour, and we didn't even get through the tour before. We had to literally take them and sit them on the side of the road when we were touring and go the next day to a music store in that town and buy some Fender amps. I mean, uh, to me, and this is just, of course, my personal opinion, PV was some crap. You know, they call themselves trying to follow behind uh, Fender, you know, you can look at the Zan here and see how the P looks like an F, you know, how the Fender makes the amps, but, uh, you know, these were just some junk, you know, and uh, people say, oh, well, I might have had a problem with mine. You were one of the lucky ones. You know, that's one reason why PV ain't around now, because they made junk. Okay, the next one is my favorite acoustic guitar. It's very hard to find a real good acoustic guitar that you enjoy to play. It's not that difficult to find some electric guitars, but extremely difficult for me because Acoustic guitars are very rough on the hands, uh, you know, the, the, the gauge of the strings and just the way that they're designed. You know, my favorite playing guitar, believe it or not, is classical. I love the feel of the nylon strings on my fingers, under my fingers. But uh, this is probably the best, well, not probably the best guitar, acoustic guitar I've ever had. I took this into the studio on many occasions and played it. And uh, it sounded good, felt good. Okay, the next one is... Oh, this is back in the day. This had to have been in the early. I miss my hair. But anyway, uh, this is a uh, acoustic electric fan guitar. It looked it cool, felt like and sound like crap. 
Okay, again, this is another picture of my first American made strat. Got rid of it quickly. Uh, okay, the next one is uh, one of the favorite bands I was in. We actually opened up for, I believe, uh, Ready for the World during that time I was with this band. Because uh, that was back in the days you could see the Jerry Curls and things of that, you know, nature. And what was interesting about this particular uh, uh, show was my aunt went out. And I asked, you know, uh, the band that was coming on, I think it might have been one of the, uh, the guys from Ready for the World, uh, the guitar player. I asked him to, to borrow his app because we was playing a small, intimate club, as you can see. And uh, he let me borrow his Marshall. And that thing, man. Marshalls, I think, make some of the best amps on the planet. I mean, this that little thing kicked. It sounded good. Uh, there was no feedback, you know. I mean, I love it, you know. And as you can tell, I'm the one on the far right with the white Roadster 2 guitar. Ibanez. And speaking of the Ibanez guitar, this is the guitar I just you know, showed you when I play in concert. Uh, and the one next to it is uh, the Ibanez Artist. And that, that guitar felt really good. It probably had the best action of the guitar I've ever had. But it just didn't sound good to me. But, you know, I'm kind of stuck on that Stratocaster twangy bright sound. And here is me in concert with the Aria Pro with one of my bands. And to my far right is Big Ed. And I call him that not because of weight or, or, or size, but because of height. He was like 6'3". Uh, one of my favorite uh, bass players and great, dear good friend. And to his far right is Rob, which is the lead guitar player for the band uh, that I was in. Okay, here it is. Uh, I'm playing again in concert with Ed. And uh, I remember that was the, uh, we played a, a corporate gig and the, and the theme was Luau. You know, you see the palm trees in the background. Corporate gigs are the best gigs to have. They pay good and you got a good audience. And this is a picture of my Jay Terso, one of them. Next one is when I was doing through the keyboard stage and writing stage. One of my favorite uh, synthesized uh, keyboards is the Kawaii K12. Uh, it was like a 12-bit sampler or 12-bit keyboard. Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of grainy for electric piano, but for synth sounds, it was dynamite. One of my favorite guitars that I actually still have to this day and probably would never part with it is uh, the Horner Marlin. I forgot the number of it, but it was uh, a really good guitar. I got this guitar for like 60 bucks, and this guitar was made in the 80s, and I think it's worth like about $600 now because of the neck. It's just unbelievable. I mean, it's thin, it's light, and the action is great, and the tone is really good. Okay, the next one is me and Polo again. As you know, I'm in the far right. Uh, keyboard in the back name is Brian. Brian was a, a cool guy, a great keyboard player, a great vocalist. And then our lead singer here, John. Okay, this is where it all started. This is like, I think this was taken in like 1969, maybe, 71. Uh, you know, playing, sitting on the front, from the piano. There's always been music in my household. And here's me when I was singing lead in, the, in a, a band. That was during the time, the time was around, or they were hot. And, uh, you know, I don't consider myself a lead singer by no means, but you know, I could handle the Morris Day range. It's not that difficult to handle that. So, you know, I was the front man. And uh, I forgot the name of this club, but it was one of the coolest clubs on the south side back in the 80s and 90s. They actually had dressing rooms. And, uh, you know, it was a really nice club. They had a stage and everything. It was one of the best design clubs we played in during that time. Okay. This is me playing around with my, my bass. And as you can see, my G string broke. Back in the day, when your G string broke, it just you just left it because back then, bass strings were about forty dollars, you know. And it's good to see that they've come down. And uh, back then, you couldn't get a single string, you know. Like like I said, the G string broke because all that thumping, and uh, you know you couldn't go to the store and say just give me a G string. It's about a whole set, and that was forty dollars. Okay, try to wrap this up here. This is one of uh, a Les Paul copy. One of my favorite ones. I got it at the pawn shop for like $60. And I played that thing for like two years before I just, you know, just got rid of it, sold it. This is one of the bands I was in. Uh, my brother-in-law to my far right was the band leader, tremendous bass player, 
He's played uh, with all types of uh, musicians, uh, Herbie Hancock, uh, some other jazz guys, Ramsey Lewis. He's been on Soul Train, and I was quite honored and flattered when he asked me, you know, would I like to play with him? I'm like, man, I can't play like you guys. You guys are professionals. You know, and he talked me into it, and, uh, you know, we played for a few, few years. Pretty good. It's me and my jazz box. After I got my uh, Jay Tercer, I got rid of that jazz box. Jazz box are kind of overrated. You can kind of get that tone with them by the guitars. Here's me at my wedding reception. My bass player and my drummer. The drummer there uh, used to play with Slave, and uh, he flew all the way back, you know, into town just to perform at my wedding reception because we were we were good friends. I mean, we used to live down the street, so I appreciate it. And okay, next picture up. Another picture of my wedding reception. And that's what's cool about the, the guys that I play with. You know, we all thought alike because I play several instruments and my bass player here, as you can see, he's playing keyboards. So we were able to really mix it up. On one tune, I might be playing uh, guitar. Next, I might be playing bass, might be playing keyboard, might be playing drums. So, you know, we had a, we had a, a, a lot of versatility in the band, you know, and, and it's really good to have versatility because you can do so much more when other people are willing and wanting to do other, play other things, you know, as opposed to just sticking to one instrument. Okay, next one, I'm playing keyboards at a gig. Okay, uh, one of uh, my bands I played in, Polo, and these guys were awesome. <clears throat> They're my Red Strat. Okay, this is a picture of me singing at my wedding reception. I think I was singing Love Struck by Jesse Johnson from the time. Oh, this is me playing my acoustic in concert. But I'm going to wrap this up, and I hope that this has been entertaining. Until next time, take care.